today we're going to be talking about knee mechanics. Welcome to the Pilates Show, where we explore creative and innovative Pilates tips and techniques to help deepen the skill level of the movement educator while having fun. I'm your host, Casey Marie Hertz, and today we're going to be talking about knee mechanics. Knee hyperextension is something that a lot of your clients coming into the studio will have issues uh, with in their gait, in their movement, and what's really interesting about hyperextending knees is that a lot of times your clients can't even sense that this is what they do. Honestly, I am one of those people that hyperextends their knees all the time while I'm standing and teaching. I find that I can actually really tire myself out quite a bit because I'm not standing in my musculature. I'm just relying on the ligamentous system to just prop my legs, um, the lower leg and the upper leg together. Now, knee hyperextension can happen for tons of different reasons. Sometimes it's uh, from, let's say, something like ballet training for some of your clients. In others, that ligamentous system is just loose, loosely put together. They have hypermobility in their joints all over the place and the knees are one of those places that really sticks out to you and says, hmm, there's something going on here. So footwork is really nice to help remedy this situation to get your clients to really sense themselves in space. Uh, you take all of the pressure off of the body because they're lying down on the reformer. Then you can start to kind of tweak and play with you know, foot mobility, ankle mobility, and hip mobility, which is really key to having the knees not take such a, a brunt of the effort. Now, if you think about what the knee joint is in general, all it is is the space in between the bottom part of the leg, which is the tibia and the fibula, and the upper part of the leg, which is the femur. Uh, I like to think of it as a pass-through of the connective tissue and musculature uniting the lower leg and the upper leg. The patella is there, that kneecap, that bone at the front, that's there to protect that pass-through. Okay, and so um, what we want to try to do is find balanced work on the upper leg, front back, side to side, as well as the lower leg, front back, side to side, without going into too much pressure at the back of the knee. Now, if you think about also the anatomy of the back of the knee, it's, we're not just concerned about all the ligamentous structure, tendon structure, and muscles that are back there, which there are a ton, but it's also a place uh, where there's lots of vasculature, right? There's lots of lymphatics um, system. There's also a, a ton of nervous system and actually hormone receptor sites at the back of the knee. So all of these things can create interesting tensions, um, interesting alignments, so that, uh, because your body will absolutely try to protect that, that tender area at all costs. Now, it might not end up as looking like uh, tension or, or rigidity at the back of the knee. It might actually come into the form of at the front of the knee or where the patella is a little off scent, front, back, or side to side. So lots of mechanics going on. So let me just show you real quick on myself what it looks like to see someone with a hyperextended knee. So I'm good at this, so I'll show you. So I'm gonna lay down onto the reformer. My feet are gonna be on the bar. I'm gonna find my neutral pelvis and spine. I need to scoot up just a little bit into the shoulder rest. So from here, I'm gonna press out to straight legs. And once I hit my straight point, hyperextending knees actually drop down and bow into the leg. So I go further than my straight leg position. Again, this puts this type of hyperextension puts a lot of pressure in the knee joint on the cartilage there. It really does make you rely on your ligamentous structure when really we want to really find our, our stability and um, our strength 
through the muscular system. So it might look like a tiny difference between hyperextended and straight, but it means a lot to the health and longevity of the joint. Now, you can cue your clients to find a stop point here. But what happens and what I've found is that if you just tell them, okay, straighten, straighten, stop, that's as far as I want you to go, they're still activating the whole of their leg in the same way they would if they would drop them down. So what we wanna try to find is a richer, more in-depth activation of the whole leg, creating lots and lots of contrast without just telling them to stop the same old way that they've always done it. So what I have here are a few smart spine products that we can use. And what I would like to say is that the cervical disc ones I found have been the most successful with this type of work because they have a nice little space for the kneecap to move. It's also much more stable so that the smart spine doesn't fall. So one of the most difficult things about having hyperextended knees is that you don't sense them at all. It's like they're not there. So placing these smart spines on top of the knee absolutely starts to highlight that we want that joint to move and we want to really focus on it. And then if you can heat it up, well, let me tell you, it's phenomenal because the front of the knee joint, because the back is open and hyperextended, the front of the knee joint can get so rigid and so tight during the day. So what I have my clients do is, again, neutral pelvis and spine. Then from here, what I ask them to do is how far can they open up the front of the hip joint into extension, trying not to move these nice little smart spine discs in space. Like I wanna keep them up in the air. So from that point, as I'm working that cue, this starts to open. I already have my core engaged and I'm starting to move from a much different point than I would typically just press into. My femurs start to go into the back of the socket and I start to activate the lateral hip here, which is really nice because those are your knee stabilizers. Then from there, as I extend the legs out, I try again to keep these smart spines up in the air as high as humanly possible. So I'm really focusing on the mechanics of the knees, which is helping me to arrange and activate all the way through the body. Then from here, it's really hard to hyperextend because I know that I have to keep these nice little smart spine discs up in the air and I have to find that full extension of the hip without dropping into hyperextension. This is such a trick. Then from here, what I want to do is see how far I can bring these discs up in the air, trying to keep my hips as wide and as open as possible. Once I have that fascial activation, I can start to really float these discs up, up as high as I can as I bring myself back in. It's almost like a flying saucers that want to stay off the ground. So as you work your clients with this cueing, again, it doesn't have to be a smart spine disc. Anything that can drape over the knee and have lots of weight so that they can feel what their knees are doing and how they're arranging can work. This really does bring a completely different sense of use of the legs, trying to keep these discs nice and elevated, no gripping in the glutes. It gives lots of rich re-education of how much work it takes to go out to straight legs. Again, people with hyperextended knees, they do it because they can just drop and sit into that space. This type of footwork really gets them to sense where they are and move in a completely different manner.
This question comes into us from Twitter asking about what do you do with new clients that start to experience lots of cramping in the feet, calves, and hamstrings when you start to work with them? This is an excellent question and quite frankly it happens all of the time in the studio. So people that haven't moved in, I would say the Pilates way, a lot of times um, haven't experienced the ranges of motion that we're asking them to go into. They may have never been on anything like a reformer at all. And so these new activations, new ranges of motion in their joints can be really challenging and start to stimulate their neurological system in, in, in great ways, but then also sometimes in not so great ways, they'll get um, cramping or tingling um, in their extremities and um, things just might feel a little bit off for a while while they learn to reorganize in their connective tissue structure. So especially for the feet, the calves and the hamstrings, you gotta think about the body as a whole. Uh, a lot of people have no awareness of the back body. They sit in chairs, they go into their cars, they sit at their desk, they go back into their dining room chairs, sit on the couch, and then lay down in bed. So they're not really experiencing all of the rich ranges of motion uh, that's really vital for human longevity um, and pliability and strength. So we got to start small with, with these clients. If we think about it, we have a sling of connective tissue that goes from the eyebrows, wraps all the way down the back body, weaves into the back, into the legs, and all the way down to the bottom of the feet to the ball of the foot. So that's one sling of fascia, connective tissue. So when you start trying to move things in different areas, what will happen a lot of times, it's kind of like, your body starts to borrow from Peter to pay Paul. So say we're trying to do a bridge, an articulating bridge. The client brings themselves up into that positioning. A, they haven't been into an open, extended hip in a long time. Plus, you're asking them to roll through their spine, which they might not have done. It takes a lot of room to be able to do that in your body. So what happens? It shortens quickly into the legs to allow more space at the front of the hip and to move the spine. You know, you have to start little by little trying to get ease in every piece of the motion, but it can be a little bit shocking at first. So what I like to do is just some nice release work that the clients can go home with and work on because you know if your clients come in just once or twice a week into the studio to practice these things that's not enough for them to have a really steady progress of advancement in how to, to masterfully move within the exercises that we want them to but release work that's something that you can get them to do at home hundreds maybe not so much so what i could have them do is either start off on a green spiky ball like i have down here or a tennis ball if they feel that they're up to it. And you just start to roll out the bottom of the foot, massaging the tissue, looking for areas of tension. And what we're doing, even though we're only, only rolling out the foot, again, like I was talking about before, that sling of connective tissue that unites the back body all the way up into the eyebrows is being effective. And, um, when you do this with your clients and they start to roll out and they start to feel like, oh, the bones of my foot are supposed to move. Wow, that feels really tender. Or, hey, this gives me a cramp in the back of the leg. You know you're in the right place. But for your clients, that might be a little bit more on the skeptical side. What I would have you do after rolling out the foot is to have them go into a hamstring stretch and they can absolutely feel the difference just from rolling out the foot between their right and left leg. It can be pretty pronounced. So then they start to go, oh, so this is how my, bo how my body is really connected, that I don't have all of these separate parts that turn on and off, but all of the connective tissues working in continuum with one another. Now, rolling your feet out on a ball not only opens up just the back of, or sorry, the bottom of the foot, but it also helps to help the mechanics of the ankle, which then opens up the back of the gastroc. So this is a really good starting place, getting people into their bodies. This is actually a really good starting place for a session so that people can embody, feel where they're at, start to warm up that connective tissue, and then you can go on from there. 
The other thing I wanted to note about that too is sometimes what you need to do is get your clients into those positions that cramp them and they'll cramp on that first try, on that first go at that exercise, say like bridging, but then once they get down, relax, reset, then go back to it, a lot of times the cramping subsides because it's a little le bit less shocking and the body knows what's it expected of it rather than going in cold. That's all for today. If you have any questions that you'd like to see answered on an upcoming episode, you can list it below on Facebook, Twitter, or a forum. See you next time and never stop learning. Is that one, this one? Okay. Sweet. Oh my God. D does that, is that, did I, I said that right, right? That's all, that's it for, okay. I'm just gonna go for it. Okay.